Hi everyone, I'm Myron Silverstein, the creator of Piano Unlocked. I'm a concert pianist, and my recordings get on best of lists in magazines like Fanfare, and they get incredible reviews from places like the American Record Guide and Music Web International. And I'm here to share with you the exact same tricks and tips that I use when I'm learning music. What I teach works whether you're brand new to the piano, or whether you're a concert pianist yourself, or whether you're somewhere in between. Make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel and click on the bell icon to get alerts when I put new videos up. Also, make sure to subscribe to my email list at pianounlock.com to get each new tip as soon as I put it online. Today I'm going to teach you how to find the best fingering for piano music. After all, we only have 10 fingers, and there are 88 keys on the piano, so unless you're playing something with just a few notes, you're going to have to make some decisions about what finger to use on what note. This is something that comes up all the time in lessons. I have advanced students who spend an entire lesson going through a piece of music with me and writing in the fingering. And I have newer students who say that the thing that gives them the most trouble is getting halfway through a phrase and discovering that they don't have enough fingers left to finish. So what are some ways that you can make sure that your fingering never leaves you scrambling for notes? The first key is to look over your music and get a quick overview of its shape. This melody begins by going up, so your first thought might be to begin with your thumb on B. But five notes later, the melody drops to G, and then to F sharp. So if you begin with your thumb, you'll have to change hand position right away. And if you start on your third finger, you'll run out of fingers before you reach the top of the phrase. But if you start with your second finger, you won't have to move your hand at all until you reach the F sharp, and then you'll just sneak your second finger over your thumb and immediately return to the position you started with. That's much better, by the way, than using your thumb to play the F sharp after you play the G. If you do that, you'll have to play at least two notes in a row with your thumb. And that's a lot of extra movement. Plus, it breaks the phrase. You also want to make sure that your finger turns are comfortable and easy to execute. Most people begin learning piano with a five finger position, where you keep your fingers all in a row over five notes. But if you do that here, your thumb will be on the F and your fifth finger on the C. And then you'd have to turn your thumb under your fifth finger to reach the D, E, and F. You can see how uncomfortable that looks. It's also uncomfortable to turn with a finger other than your thumb. For example, if I play the F and the C with my thumb and my fifth finger, look at how I'll have to contort my hand to turn my third finger over my fifth to finish the melody. But if I stretch my thumb and index finger between F and C, I don't have to change positions. Okay. But what if that stretches your hand out too much? Well, then you could use your third finger on the C and turn your thumb for the D. Turning your thumb after the third or fourth finger isn't awkward at all. So those are the two most basic keys to piano fingering. Look over your music, see what directions the notes are going in, where the top and bottom of the phrase or part of the phrase is, and figure out a fingering that will let you change hand position as little and as comfortably as possible. It works both for melodies and for chords. The next key is to take advantage of your finger's different strengths. That's both for convenience and for musicality. For example, your thumb is a heavy finger. Its natural tendency is to play a little louder than the other fingers. When you first start to practice scales, for example, uh, they might sound like this. As you learn how to even out your sound, you won't hear your thumb quite so much. Even so, if you use a fingering that puts your thumb on notes that you want to be particularly quiet, like a note passing between two accented notes, for example, you'll have to work harder to control the volume than if you use a naturally quieter finger there. The fourth finger is a naturally weak finger, and moving back and forth between the fourth and fifth fingers is especially tricky. 
This melody alternates between the E and the F at the top. So my first instinct might be to use 4 and 5. But if that movement between 4 and 5 gives me trouble, I could turn my thumb and then use 3 and 5. Or I could land on 5 at the top of the scale and then use 3 and 4 for the movement between the two notes. You'll have your own preferences based on what feels best for your hand. The important thing is to find a fingering that lets you play the music as easily and as beautifully as possible. Also, look for patterns, shapes that repeat throughout the music. For example, a lot of music uses something called sequences, a melodic shape that gets moved up and down the piano. Usually, you can keep the fingering that works well for that shape no matter where it starts. The exception would be if the sequence sometimes starts on a white note and sometimes starts on a black note. You might need to work out two different fingerings in that case. This is the beginning of Muskovsky's etude in F. If I slow it down, you can see that it's based on a sequence of three notes. The starting note, then up one, then back down. If I use the fingers 2, 4, 3, 2, 4, 3, 2, 4, 3, I can just kind of walk my way down the keyboard and never have to change my hand's actual position. And if you look at the music, you can immediately see that every group of notes has the same shape. So you'll want to choose a fingering that you can repeat, the same way the shape of the music repeats. The last key I'm going to talk about today is dividing the music between your hands, or letting your hands help each other out. Most piano music is written on a grand staff, and usually the right hand plays what's on the top staff, while the left hand plays what's on the bottom staff. But there's no rule that says that the right hand has to play from the top staff and the left hand has to play from the bottom staff. What you see on the paper is often something that's convenient to print and to read, but it's not necessarily something that's convenient to play. At the beginning of Chopin's Polonaise Fantasy, for example, there's a series of five notes that goes up octave by octave to the top of the keyboard. The fingering printed here suggests that you should take the bottom few notes with the left hand, and then, when the music is printed in treble clef, take all of the remaining notes with the right hand. And the tempo is slow enough that you can do that without too much trouble. But you could also alternate between right and left hands, moving hand over hand. I find that to be a much more convenient and elegant way to play this passage, and it makes it easy, if I want, to include a burst of speed in this opening flourish. In my own fifth piano sonata, I'm a composer as well as a pianist, by the way, there's a passage where I hold a chord in the bass with the pedal, while I play a melody in the upper treble, and play quick notes in the lower treble. I need to have the lower staff in bass clef to show the held chord, so the quick notes have to be in the upper staff, but those notes have to be played with the left hand. There is simply no way to play both that and the melody with the right hand. Probably my favorite example of the difference between a good way to print music and a good way to play it is this Rachmaninoff etude, opus 33, number 2. Both hands are in the treble clef, and the most natural way to print it is for the high melody to be on top of the accompaniment. But the accompaniment is extremely uncomfortable to play in the left hand. It goes back and forth between the fourth and fifth fingers very quickly, and it's very hard to keep the volume and rhythm even. <laughs> But guess what? It's almost tailor-made for the right hand. Going back and forth between thumb and index finger is no problem at all. When I play this etude, I cross my hands for the whole piece, and it's actually a lot of fun to play.
Now, you might wonder, well, if this is an etude, maybe Rachmaninoff wrote it that way explicitly to develop the fourth and fifth fingers of the left hand. After all, there are pieces like Ravel's Concerto for the Left Hand Alone where it would definitely be cheating to play it with two hands instead of one, or to play it with the right hand instead of the left. But the Rachmaninoff etude does not say in the score that the hands have to follow the division of the staffs. And in a concert hall, I feel like the goal is to make the most beautiful music possible, not to demonstrate how strong your left hand's fourth and fifth fingers are. So if crossing the hands helps you to play the music more beautifully, go for it. These are just a few of the keys to figuring out a really good fingering for any music you're working on. Remember, your fingering should fit your hand, be comfortable for you, be efficient, and help you play beautifully without having to worry about finding the next note. I've written up these keys as a PDF that you can download from pianounlock.com forward slash technique. Just find the post called Keys to Piano Fingering and download the PDF from the bottom of the post. Meanwhile, if you have any questions, please comment right below this video. And if it would be helpful for me to work closely with you as you learn your music, please send me an email at myron at pianounlocked.com to set up individual consultation. Please make sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel and click the bell icon to find out when my next video is up, and also subscribe to my email list at pianounlocked.com. Until next time, happy practicing!